Hi everyone, my name is David Adams. I'm an assistant professor at Cal Poly Humboldt. And the title of the presentation today is Action Research, a Guide for Physical Educators. So as physical educators, we have a great opportunity. Uh, many times our field is marginalized and therefore um, believe that we cannot make a strong impact in our, in our students' lives. But as we look at the California um, education standards, we know that one of the biggest things that we can do is uh, create an environment where students can become physically literate through each grade and at the end of their K through 12 experience. Uh, that physical liter literacy can happen for a class uh, and in individual students. And most importantly, uh, we want to create a student uh, who is independent. And so independence means that the student can then go out and uh, be active or physically active in a variety of different settings and across um, a number of different activities. So for this reason, physical educators are tasked with supporting the learning and growth of students in the three learning domains. And if we looked at the California physical education standards, you would see that those three learning domains are the cognitive domain. Um, so we're looking at how students understand things at the younger age, it might be rules of the game. Um, at the older ages, we're talking about how to develop and implement a exercise program. Uh, the effect, affective domain uh, it is talking about students' individual responsibility to come to class prepared or be engaged in the activities. And then there's also a social component within that as well so that we have students that are working well with others. And then the psychomotor domain, which is mostly what's focused on in physical education, is the movement abilities of our students. So all three domains um, are important. And as, I, as we said a little bit earlier, mostly we, we focus on the psychomotor domain, but there's a great opportunity um, to impact students' affective and cognitive domains as well. So research. I, I think when people think of research, um, this is a lot of the pictures that we see, right? People in lab coats, uh, mice running through um, mazes, um, people uh, looking through tele or microscopes um, on computers, on laptops, um, again, in that lab setting or in a, in a confined setting or a uh, lab setting or a closed setting. Um, what we don't, what mostly isn't thought about research is that teachers, and so teachers have the opportunity to be very, very powerful researchers. And like we mentioned in that two slides ago, we're tasked with the opportunity to change students' lives and getting them to be physically literate and teaching them the appropriate skills that can make them independent and be successful. So, one way to do that is through action research. And so action research is a systematic inquiry conducted by teachers, administrators, or others with a vested interest in teaching and learning lear and teaching and learning process to identify answers. And so we all do this. Um, we all have students that are um, have difficulties in our class. And what, what Action Research is asking you to do is look at how you yourself uh, and your teaching style may impact those learnings. So that could be like the activities you've chosen, the duration of the task requirements that you're asking your students to be involved in, the role of the teacher, right? Is it a teacher-centered class? Is it a student-centered class? Um, the setting, are you indoor? Are you outdoor? What, what time of the day is physical education taking place? And then the attitude that you're presenting to your students about the class and the outlook of the students. So do they have a high motivation to come to physical education? But going back to the model, we've identified uh, six steps that teach six teaching behaviors that we think are essential for uh, physical educators. And when I do say physical educators, I wanna make sure that everybody understands that we're talking about ADE teachers as well. So um, whether you're teaching a full day of physical education or 80% of physical education classes, and then one, one AP class at your school, or you're teaching full-time AP action research um, and that systematic inquiry, uh, it works for all teachers. So the first step is observation. Uh, the second step is data collection. The third step is designing interventions. The fourth step is analyzing data. The fifth step is reporting data, and the last step is reflection of data. And I'm, I'm sure that a lot of you have heard these terms before. You've probably had classes that focus on different pieces of these steps. Um, but what we want to show today is kind of how 
you can combine all six of these steps together to support your students and those individual needs. So um, going back to or looking at how most problems or teachers solve issues in the classroom today, uh, there's really three major ways. So first one is tradition, right? Meaning the way in which things have been done in the past. So therefore, come on your campus. Um, there's certain expectations for students. If that doesn't happen, these are the consequences. Then there's authority, uh, meaning we rely on individuals of authority to tell us what works best. And as incoming teachers, uh, most of that would be from either our principal, assistant principal, or teachers who have been in the field uh, for um, a longer period than us. And then we also use common sense, which is meaning uh, using human reasoning based on what we know. The problem with all three of these is they can be unreliable and they can also be biased. So what we do know with students, especially those students with disabilities, is that one size does not fit all. So we cannot say that one intervention, just because it worked with one student, therefore um, is going to work with other students or another student in the same class. So that's why uh, action research is so powerful and it takes us away from doing these three steps. So we don't wanna do the traditional thing. We don't wanna be, do what's been done unless there's evidence to support it for a specific population. Yes, we, I agree and I fully support communicating and collaborating with other teachers. But we want to make sure that it's not coming from bias state, that what we're, the information that is being provided is based on research. Okay. Um, so here's kind of a breakdown of what happens in those teaching behaviors for the action research model. So an observation, our main focus is to identify key behaviors of the student and teacher that may be impacting those learning things. So remember we said like the duration of the class, the setting that the student's being placed in, the style of teaching that we're using, uh, the duration of the activities that we're asking the students to do. Then we move to data collection, and um, as you all are in a graduate program, I'm sure you've heard of these terms, standardized and informal assessments. So the use of multiple assessments to make decisions or plan for students should be used. And so standardized could be anything from the fitness gram, um, which we know that is currently not um, being accessed as it was in the past, or the TGMD or another standardized test. And then we have informal assessments, which could in include like student portfolios. Um, we have task analysis, we have rubrics, you can have uh, um, questionnaires or surveys you have with your students. Then we move into designing interventions. I think this is personally my um, favorite topic. Um, because it allows us to dive into the research and see what's worked in the uh, for students of similar populations demonstrating the similar behaviors. So again, we want to base those interventions on evidence-based practices or best practices. Um, there are a number of organizations that um, provide those to you, and if you're not aware of like the What Works Clearinghouse or the National Profe Professional Development Center on Autism Spectrum Disorder, or the National, National Institute of Autism, um, there are, um, there is evidence out there or um, for you to learn how to implement those, those practices. The fourth step is uh, analyzing data. And the big thing in analyzing data is we wanna break it down to make it very easy for those consumers that are coming in and looking at it. So whether it be a student, whether it be a parent, whether it be an administrator, or whether it be another teacher, we wanna make sure that our, when we um, analyze our data, that it's, uh, it's objective, okay? Um, the next one is reporting data. I wanna go back to what I just said. So actually in analyzing data, we wanna um, present it in a visually um, matter where it's not difficult for the individual to read. So in reporting data, you can use things like figures, graphs, and tables. And in those figures and graphs and tables, we wanna make it very simple for the observer to make decisions based on what is presented in front of them. So while um, some studies use like p-values, uh, which not all of us understand, um, using descriptive statistics such as mean, median, mode, um, using uh, percentages, um, and again on like a line graph would be a great way that a parent who might not understand some of these bigger scientific terms uh, such as p-value or significant uh, impact um, might have, 
we can give them graphs where they can make their own decisions based on what's in front of them. And the last one is the reflection of data. And so what that does for us is it allows us to make uh, future decisions on the directions we will go. Um, this is based on what has occurred during the time of the intervention. And then we can decide if we want to continue that use or we have to make possible changes. So the great thing about our field is we know right away if something's not working, then we just stop. We either add to it or we go in a different direction. Um, so I think that's one of the most positive things about action research is there's the opportunity to fail and just say, okay, we've made a mistake. We're going to go back. We've reflected on it. We know what we need to do now. We're going to start the process over. All right, so systematic observation. So we can see that funnel uh, on the, on the right-hand side of the screen. And so the big thing with this is we want to know exactly what behavior we are trying to change. So many times we observe students and we'll start naming one, two, three, four, multiple behaviors, right? But the one thing we want to really do is focus on the biggest behavior that's causing the student the problem. So that funnel, while it has the yellow, green, and blue, we want to focus on that red, right? Because the red is causing the difficulty for that student. So step one begins with identifying what exactly will be studied. We want to identify and limit the topic um, so we can really, really make sure that we have the right intervention. We know make sure the topic is manageable. So do you have the right support with you to do it? Um, do you have the right equipment? Step two is gathering information. So this is where we become like going to reconnaissance, right? So this is where we speak with other teachers, talk with counselors, talk with administrators, talk with parents, talk with the student, right? We talked about uh, informal assessment and using surveys or questionnaires with our students. It's great to know where the student's coming from and why they might be behaving in that certain way before you attempt to try and change that behavior. Step three is reviewing related literature. So um, we would like to look at existing sources of information. Those could be books, research journals, school or district documents that your district might have, uh, complete websites like we, um, we said before with the What Works Clearinghouse or the National Professional Development Center or the National Institute. We want to get uh, websites that have up-to-date research um, and can support our understanding. And then again, we want to define or limit the problem, right? So we want to define um, that problem. So whether it be off task or um, uh, inadequate inability to complete a motor skill, we want to make sure that we really define what it is so we can make sure that we're, we're, we know when there's been a change in the behavior. And then we want to develop an appropriate research design and select valid instruments for measurement. So this all goes in to the part of that systematic observation. Okay? Um, and then we can use systematic recording sheets. So here we just have a recording sheet and what you can see the activity is for volleyball. The assigned task was individual and small group practice and gameplay. So on the left hand, you saw that it's for a class, right? The first box. We're just looking at, does the class have a positive attitude? What's the engagement level of the class? Are there possible constraints that might be uh, in inhibiting the student's ability to perform and constraints. We can look at individual, we can look at environmental constraints, or we can look at task constraints, right? And then what accommodations might be needed? And then is there a modification that might be needed? And so we can do the same thing for the individual student. So positive attitude, engagement, possible constraints, accommodation, modifications. You can read this on your own, but you can see the notes that were taken, right? And so because of that, uh, of those notes, we know, we've taken our observation, we've been very specific on what we see from the student and we're identifying uh, behaviors that the student needs to improve on. Here's another example um, for basketball. So again, same thing, we identify the setting, uh, individual and small group practice and gameplay, and again, we, we look at those engagement levels. But I, I, what I think is really important in this recording sheet is that we write notes. So we take notes while we're doing it. And that's a big thing. So your collecting of data or your study begins when you start observing that student in their natural environment and you're starting to collect data on them. So like in the first part, 70 to 80% of the class were not engaged during the dribbling activity. But we know for the individual student that Jason was on task for 10% of dribbling activity 
and struggled with performing the attacking move. So we've identified a concern for the class in terms of engagement and possibly understanding um, or motivation for our individual student. All right, so then we go on to data collection, right? And so in that picture, we're trying to get as much as we possibly can on our student. So that's why we have the observation sheets that we use. Um, but for data collection, we want to determine specifically which type of data will be collected. We also want to decide what type of instruments that will be used. So again, those standardized um, assessments, we know standardized are valid and reliable. They, they have pre-established outcomes that they're looking for. Um, we have pre-established equipment and age groups that they're appropriate for. And again, like those informal assessments, which I am fully in for, and I think informal assessments are great because you, the teacher, um, uh, develop them based on what you see and what you actually want to assess from your students. So again, like learning how to uh, build rubrics, learning how to build task analysis, learning how to have, uh, develop surveys or questionnaires, or having your students complete portfolios, having conversations with your students. So those portfolios are also a really, really powerful tool um, because it's the longevity. It shows the, the quality of the student's performance throughout the whole semester or throughout the time that the student was under um, being observed. Um, so I, I really like portfolios and I like when teachers have students developing portfolios within the class uh, because it supports uh, students' knowledge. And I'll, I say that because I have myself have my own student and when I go into his first grade teacher, um, she shows me a huge portfolio of, of my, my son's work. And what it really does for me is it allows me to understand where my student is perform performing. So your portfolio could be showing of rubrics that the student has done on different um, movements or task analysis where the student's been graded on or surveys that they completed or questionnaires. So portfolios, I think, are a really strong tool for physical educators to develop. All right. So here's an example of a rubric. This is a volleyball skills rubric. Um, we're not going to walk through everything, but I think the, the big thing that you know about rubrics is there's different levels of performance. So in this level, there's no skill, um, which maybe we want to change the, the name of it if we're going to show it to a student. But then there's basic skill, intermediate skill, advanced skill, and excellent skill. And the great thing about rubrics is you can be really fun with it um, and make it, you know, minor leagues, major leagues, all-star, and then, uh, you know, World Cup, whatever you want to do with it. So you can have a lot of fun with rubrics. We also have task analysis where you can break down the skill into different components. So again, um, when you're collecting that data, you have to have something that allows you to, again, for the individual skill. We were doing volleyball across a number of skills in volleyball. And then for this one, um, we were looking at a basketball skill So, um, and their shooting ability. So again, it gives you the chance to complete notes. So. Was the skill completed, yes or no, um, at each one of those major components, six components. All right, so now we're going into selecting, designing, and implementing interventions. So when we select an intervention, we have to look at, is it a whole class intervention or is it an individual student? And so some of these interventions on the whole class, like the pre-MAC principle, like modeling, like video modeling, prompting, can be provided to the individual student. So I'm not, I'm not hoping that you, you're understanding that these interventions, besides really the group contingency, that's really the only, and structured play groups, that's really the only one where you need more than one individual student. And even structured play groups, they can be based on one student, um, but you need a group of students to complete the intervention. So whole class interventions, great things, group contingencies, right? If the, if the whole class performs a certain behavior for a certain amount of time or a number of uh, um, performances, then there's a reward after it. So it's a reward system. And then we have visual supports, which are very powerful for a lot of our students. Um, so we have modeling, video modeling. And then there's um, verbal prompting that we can give or prompting in gestures. And then you have social narratives. And then for ind individual students, you have antecedent-based interventions discrete trial training, self-management, which is a huge need for a lot of students in controlling their own behaviors and completing tasks. 
you have task analysis that we um, showed in the past slide, reinforcement, whether that's positive or negative reinforcement. There's also punishment, which, which is in here. So you have positive punishment, and negative punishment. And then again, you have some of those interventions that cut across both individual and whole classes, uh, such as video modeling and video prompting. So these are some of the interventions that are out there. Um, they are not all of them. And again, I, I, would, I would encourage all of you to go on some of those major websites, get into, dig deep into the reading, see what's out there um, and what you can, you can train your own self in or practice using while you're in your uh, graduate program when you're working with students. All right, so we went from the selection and now we're going into design and implementation. So this is where we really get deep into it and we have to decide based on the student uh, when the intervention will begin. So you know you have that ABC model or the antecedent behavior consequence. So the antecedent, it obviously occurs before that behavior and the consequence uh, uh, occurs after the behavior has happened. And so remember, um, consequence can be a positive or negative. So remember, like we said, positive punishment or positive reinforcement, negative, pun negative reinforcement, or positive punishment where we bring something positive or negative reinforcement. Uh, who will get, who will implement the intervention? Um, many times it's you as a general ed uh, teacher or the AP teacher. If you have support staff in there and you can train them how to uh, implement the intervention and you have um, you have confidence that they know what they're doing and you know that's why we say on the bottom of that how will they demonstrate so when we say how will they demonstrate understanding we want to make sure before we allow support staff or students if you were doing like peer modeling we want to make sure that they're actually implementing the intervention correctly prior to um, providing it for the student um, of need okay and then how often will the intervention occur so are we going to do it after every behavior um, is it going to be based more on a, uh, a certain number of behaviors that we're going to have to see? Uh, will the intervention be provided at a certain time? And certain times could be prior to the class, uh, in, during, prior to instruction beginning, uh, prior to an activity or in between each activities? Or is it, like we said, kind of that end of the class where it's more of a reinforcement? Um, also, you look at the duration and the performance. So when we design and implement this, how are we going to determine um, the performance or when, it, when, when we can actually say uh, with confidence that there's success or change being determined or when will we have to say uh, the, the intervention is not working and therefore we need to go back and make changes to it. So design and implementation, key part of the action research model. All right, so reporting data. Now, if you have Dr. Bittner or Dr. Amanda, I'm sure, Amanda Young, I'm sure you've um, heard about single case design or single subject design. Um, but I do believe for our population, because we have low incidence dis uh, populations, low incidence disabilities on our, in our classes, uh, meaning that there's a small number of children with autism, small number of children with intellectual disabilities, a small number of children with emotional disturbance, a small number of uh, children with disabilities or a visual impairment in our class. A lot of times I believe that single case design is more appropriate for the type of studies we're doing and it allows us, um, as other research does, but it allows us a systematic approach to collecting data. So as you can see in the graph below um, that they had uh, class period, so they had four class periods where they collected data, and it was on the number of correct serves, and then they uh, implemented a visual cue, and that visual cue, you can see that there was an immediacy of effect, so right, where the immediacy of effect, we're looking at um, the change from the baseline to the first data point of the intervention. You can also see there's an upward trend in the data, in, or in the performance of the student, uh, we can also look at the variability of data. Now, is all this needed for uh, when you go into an IEP meeting or when you present it to the students? I'm not sure it is, right? But you can definitely talk to your students and parents and uh, principals and other teachers about this uh, to better clarify. But the great thing about these graphs is I, I believe that any parent, student, 
administrator would look at this graph without the additional arrows and say, you know what, it looks like uh, based on the visual cues that you're providing that the student's performance has uh, improved. So, and why is this important? Because we have to remember that results matter. So while your project may have been individual or personal, there are a lot of teachers out there that are looking for answers. And so we need to report data. We need to have uh, our, we need to demonstrate what we're doing in our classes, especially when we're having success. Um, so results present in an easy to understand format. We talked about this graphs, tables, but we focus on the data that has been collected through, throughout and how that drove the decisions you made. So again, a parent or administrator would come in, they'd see the data here and they'd say, look, we believe that continued use of visual cues is appropriate for the student's behavior or to in increase their behavior. And then we allow the parties to make objective decisions based on the data you present. But like we said, um, I, I'm pretty confident that uh, any individual who came in and looked at this, this um, graph would say with confidence uh, that visual cues was um, a positive impact on the student's behavior. All right, here's another type of systematic data collection. Um, and so in this one, again, what we want to also do is we, you know, you got, you all will be responsible for writing up uh, data, and but it can be very simple. Um, it doesn't have to be too complex. It doesn't have to take up three to four hours of your time. And I, so I tried to break it down uh, in a very simple and easy way to go forward with it. So, um, you know, in this one, we have a baseline, which is in that first phase right there. And so all we have to report to the parent or the individual looking at it is during the baseline phase, Kevin demonstrated 15% of the correct underhand serves. Great, right? The intervention, we said the teacher developed a plan of action with Kevin and allowed the student to set a desired performance criteria. So we've just given autonomy to the student and we hope that by giving the autonomy of the student, we increase their intervention or increase their motivation and therefore will increase their performance or desire to perform at a higher level. The outcome goal, which the student set, Kevin set his performance criteria to complete 80% of the required skill and at minimum two of three days by the end of the four weeks. So great, now we know what the intervention is, we know what the outcome goal is, we can have, um, we can keep track of it and let the student know, and it's a visual that everybody can understand. So in week one, we can see that Kevin met his predetermined goal at 20%. In week two, Kevin met his predetermined goal at 40%. Week three, remember, important, he has to meet it two out of three days. Kevin made it, met the requirement in two out of the three days, which still is appropriate. And in the last um, week, Kevin met his week four performance criteria of 80% of the required skill. So this is a changing criterion design. And if you'll see, if you notice this, all that means is that we change the criteria of performance that we expect from the students from our baseline to our next week or our next day, if you're going at that point, to our next week or day to our next week. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you've been told in your classes that um, to determine if something is successful or support it, we want to get at least three to five, four to six data points. Um, so if we only have one data point here, there's not a lot of strength to suggest that what we're doing had a positive impact. Um, so while we only have three days here, I would fully support you or fully support collecting more data and maybe doing week one through two, weeks two through uh, three through four, and so on. So giving your student more opportunity to demonstrate their ability to meet the behavior performance that's been set. So changing criterion design, and this is a simple A, B design, and all that means is we have an A, which is our baseline, which is this area right here, and then a B, uh, which is our intervention phase right there. So two types of designs, both that I think are visually appealing, uh, nice for parents, students, administrators to look at, uh, easy to understand, and again, a simple write-up allows um, parents that can understand what's going on. All right, so continued with uh, the reporting of this data. So it strengthens the presence of physical education on the campus. So uh, many of you will find out 
or you will see, even if you're doing some of your student teaching right now, that sometimes physical education is marginalized, right? We're not um, necessarily invited to the IEP meetings or at the IEP meetings, um, the goals that are set don't represent what's happening in physical education. So you might have a social goal and instead of looking at you and saying, well, what goals do you have for your student in physical education class? They might say, you know what, so-and-so, we'd like you to work on these social skills in your physical education class which by no means is a bad thing, we want to collaborate, but we want to increase the presence of physical education on the campus and by re reporting this type of data, we can show that there's a systematic approach to the teaching that we're doing and the support that we're giving to the classroom and individual students that we have. It also allows for data-driven decisions to be made and so that protects you as the teacher because um, there are instances instances where parents uh, can bring lawsuits against the school for not providing the uh, um, appropriate services. And so you want to make sure that you uh, are always um, doing what's best for you. And so collecting that data, um, keeping it um, so that if ever questioned, you can say, look, here's what I'm doing in my class. Here's why I'm doing it. Um, only supports you as a teacher. And then uh, we also which I think is a huge part, we strengthen your presence or the physical educator's presence uh, uh, in the as a physical educator as part of the IEP team, which is essential, right? We want, just like they give the um, classroom teacher or the general ed teacher time, they give the special education teacher time, we want that same amount of time and respect given to us as the physical education uh, teacher or the AP teacher. Our presence matters on campus. We know that physical education, physical activity has had profound uh, impact on students' uh, performance, whether academically, socially, uh, because we have those three domains that we work for. So cognitive, psychomotor, and affective. Um, so strengthening our position within the classroom is huge and on campus is even bigger. All right, so then we go to reflection of data. And so reflection of data is the opportunity for teachers to determine the direction moving forward. And so we've gone through all these steps, observation, data collection, designing interventions, analyzing data, reporting data, and now we're at reflection of data. We have to look back and say, what have we done? What changes may be needed moving forward? Was the, was the intervention successful, right? Did I collect enough data? Um, all these things need to be answered because we need to determine what works for that class or for that individual student. Um, so the reflection of data is a really big part of this um, because it allows us to move forward. Um, so I always think that everybody, and most of us do, we reflect at the end of the class every single time, but writing it down I think is a key thing. So what happened in the class for that day? Uh, what happened at the end of the study? Um, moving forward, do we request any additional support? Do we need more equipment? Is there additional funding that needed? needed? Uh, what is possible? Does it illustrate so what is possible in physical education? So you need to show what you're doing in your classroom and that this action research model, if followed, allows you to do that. And, and that's the greatest thing. And I will say this, you can be a physical education teacher and you can do what every other teacher or a lot of teachers do, and that's just go with the flow. Um, and you can work for 25 years, but I can tell you um, from personal experience and from teaching and speaking with other teachers um, that I do not think you'll enjoy your day as much as if you take on the, the responsibility of being a researcher and really getting to know your students and what impacts you have on their academic performance. Um, once we do that, we can really start to make changes uh, in the students that we have, their lives. So again, this is a short presentation on action research. I hope that this, um, this supports your understanding. Um, you know, again, my email is dha13. I'm at humboldt.edu. If any of you have questions, um, you are free to email me, but I will say you've got two of the better faculty I know in higher education that you're working under. So Dr. Melissa Bittner and Dr. Amanda Young, both of them uh, have a high level of knowledge in action research and can answer some of these questions as well. So again, I appreciate um, the opportunity to give this presentation and I hope this has uh, supported all of your understanding.
Thank you.